Good morning. Welcome to worship. Thanks for joining us this morning. A reminder that in addition to our Sunday worship here, we also offer Kids Connection uh, for all of our kids on Sundays by Zoom. And Chelsea Gilbert is live with our kids each Sunday. So to participate, all you need to do is register, and you can do that on our website or by clicking the link on our e-news. And you'll sign up and get the Zoom link. We are also continuing to offer DVDs for those who have a difficult time watching these services uh, through an internet connection. And so if you know of somebody who would like a DVD of some recent services, contact the church office and we will get those to them. Um, You know, it's been a long week uh, as we reflect on events in our nation, and I want to speak to that in my message today. But uh, we gather today knowing that God... God's love surrounds us, and his grace is extended to us, and we gather in that assurance this morning. We continue with our worship. Thanks for the life you bring and the spirit you give us. Help us to feel that and tap into that during difficult times, to feel your life and your love and to be on fire and to show love to each other and to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Good shepherd of my soul, come dwell within me. Take all I am and Before the cross of Christ, 
this is my sacrifice a life laid down and ready to follow the troubled find their peace in true surrender the prisoners they release from chains of anger in springs of living grace I find my Today's reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as he was coming up from the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Here ends the reading. Well, good morning. On Wednesday, I was busy working downstairs in my makeshift office, getting stuff done, and I had notifications popping up on my phone uh, as we got in later into the afternoon, and I was largely ignoring them, but I, I knew that it was about something happening in Washington. And then Maria came down and asked me if I knew what was happening, and she started showing me the images and footage, and it was one of those moments where even if you try, you can't go back to what you're doing. Last week, I began my message by asking this. Imagine a period in history when there's increasing diversity in society, there's instability in politics, both foreign and domestic, increasing skepticism about truth and a lack of trust throughout society, with leading authorities reinforcing that extreme viewpoints, conspiracy theories, and cult-like movements are on the rise. Of course, that depiction was shared as a description of what bishop, theologian, and philosopher St. Augustine lived through during his life in the fourth century. But perhaps we find even more similarities between our time and Augustine's time this week. His insight then and our insight gained this week is that what we give our hearts and minds to, has consequences. Martin Luther put it another way so many years ago. Whatever you think about when you wake up and when you go to bed, there is your God. When consorted truth, rage, and conspiracy theories in service of a single person become those ever-present thoughts, we see where that leads. I encourage you to reflect on last week's message again if you'd like to revisit the difference between a well-grounded theory and a conspiracy theory. It's a moment for all of us to re-examine the sources we seek for information and truth. But we also know that some actions are not based in an assessment of truth at all. 
They come out of a place of fear and despair. And I heard that in the voices of a number who were interviewed during the chaos. Last week I spoke about Augustine and a wrong turn very early in his life. He joined a cult, unbeknownst to him when he went into it. He left, but it scarred him for a long time afterward. It brought him to a place where for some time after he wasn't sure that he could trust anything or anyone. We think that skepticism will protect us from falsehood. But for Augustine, it left him in a place of despair and apathy, according to author Jennifer Hockenberry. Hockenberry is a friend of ours from our days in Milwaukee. She says that skepticism doesn't protect us from falsehoods. Instead, it eventually leads to a kind of apathy that makes us indifferent to falsehoods. Truth, lies, fiction, what's the difference? I think we see this today. Some may even acknowledge the falsehoods, but those who share them may not care. It comes at least in part from a place of despair and apathy. Hockenberry says that skepticism and conspiracy theories are two sides of the same coin. Think of that. Skepticism, conspiracy theories, two sides of the same coin. Neither trusts that truth can be known through empirical observation, reason, dialogue, and human interactions. They leave the discernment completely to the individual. It's a kind of radical individualism. Augustine said that a society that doesn't provide confidence that truth can be found through things like science, philosophy, debate, and dialogue will be a society with citizens incapable of carrying out their duties in and with their community. So here's what I take away from that. If we want our society to function, which it doesn't seem to be doing very well at the moment, we have to be able to agree on some common facts and reason and be able to talk and interact with each other. Obviously, that's been additionally difficult during the pandemic, but our ability to talk across differences with each other has been eroding for decades. It's one of the reasons why in our All Saints vision we talk about the importance of having conversations that matter and helping to make a positive impact in our community by fostering these kinds of conversations. We have to be able to talk about real stuff. For some, as I said last week, sharing reason and truth don't seem to help. Every attempt to share truth becomes that much more reason for resistance and the belief that it is an attempt at deception. That's a hallmark and trap of a cult in some cases, something that Augustine's mother faced with her own son when he had been sucked into that for a time. Greater understanding and dialogue may not help with some, but with our neighbors and those we love, our community, do we have the choice but to take the risk? Of course, that requires the ability to listen across disagreements without demonizing one another. It takes more than one side to accomplish that. When there are disagreements in any community, how do you seek greater understanding rather than simply assume the worst? When there's anger, it's human nature to become defensive. But over time, is it possible to seek to understand that anger in others who are not like us? Understanding doesn't mean accepting it, but it provides an opportunity to learn. In the course of writing those words, a new notification came across my phone. A headline calls for violence intensify. Extremists have increased online chatter about more violence. To arrive at some common facts and reason, we need to listen to each other, but another path forward may be found in today's gospel. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. It seems like this is a time for repentance. And you may be thinking in this moment, yep, those people need to repent big time. 
And whatever you're thinking of, whoever you're thinking of, you might be right. But what if we all did it together? What if we all examined our hearts and minds just to make sure everyone actually did it? Let's all make our list of the people who need to repent. Make it long if you need to. And then do one final thing. Add your own name at the end. Isn't it worth putting that in front of God, just between you and God, and asking for God's light and love to shine into your heart and bring renewal if it's needed anywhere, just in case? What if you ask God to open your heart and mind to his love and hope? What if you ask God to show you where you need healing and reform? My guess is we all need it. If you find yourself in a place of skepticism about that or everything else at this point, maybe you could do what Augustine did. Augustine was deeply skeptical about everything after his experience in the Manichaean cult. He started with simple things when it came to reestablishing a positive relationship with truth. He paid attention to what his senses told him, that the leaves of wild olive trees tasted bitter, that he enjoyed some of the simple things life had to offer. Back to the basics. And then he eventually moved on from there, and he recognized that much of what he knew came through relationships, necessarily. And so he re-engaged in relationships and dialogues in new ways, and he rediscovered new wisdom. We may think, whoa, who is this Augustine guy, and why are we talking about such an extreme case? Well, it seems to me that we need to get back to the basics as a society. Those who are skeptics and conspiracy theorists need to rediscover hope. Probably all of us do. And it seems like as a culture, we can't agree on the simplest of facts. Until we can figure that out and come to some shared agreement on what we can know and what we can't know, I'm not sure we have any chance of moving forward apart from various forms of conflict. One of the things pastors are called to do is share hope. In my ordination vows, I also agreed to give no false or illusory hope. John the Baptist did not give false or illusory hope either. He pointed out the dangers of people's sin and told them that they needed to turn around. It's what prophets throughout the Bible shared. There were words of warning mixed with words of hope. John the Baptist pointed the people toward a relationship, toward someone he believed they could truly trust, Jesus. John said, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, we see someone worthy of our trust, In Philippians 2, Paul says Jesus did not regard his equality with God and the privilege of that as something to be grasped and exploited. Instead, he emptied himself. In the end, he was willing to give up his own life so that we could trust that God is good and loving, that we could trust in God and find life. At the heart of sin is a lack of trust. And so Jesus came to us so that we could learn to trust God by seeing the heart of God. God is humble. Despite that, some today and always have twisted who Jesus is and make him out to be something else. In the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we see a vision of who he truly is and who God is. Ultimately, Jesus helped us see not just what we're supposed to do or how we're supposed to live, 
but how God looks upon us and our neighbors with love, with forgiveness, with hope that is paid for through sacrifice. Know that you are loved. When we experience the love of Jesus, John said Jesus will baptize or immerse us in the Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit like? The fruits or signs of the Spirit's presence are this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As people of faith, we believe that we constantly fall short of living up to those high virtues on our own. But when we acknowledge that, we trust that God's forgiveness is extended to us. We do also believe that when we pause and seek God's presence and forgiveness, we're able to receive God's spirit again, and it's possible to grow in all of those areas. We need to grow, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of one another. Last summer, following the killing of George Floyd, we offered some dialogue groups on the topic of racism for people wherever they were at to digest it together. I know that many people come with different perspectives. These groups offered a chance to dialogue on that, to review some information and have conversation about it. These were a great start toward our vision to have conversations that matter. We need to continue dialogues like that. It's a dialogue and conversation that Minnetonka faith leaders continue. We met this past week along with members of the Minnetonka Police Department, including the police chief, to discuss how we address racism together. The Minnetonka Police Department is committed to making this community safe for everyone and has been the one to initiate some of these conversations. If you're interested in continuing a conversation around racism at All Saints, let me know. There are opportunities for us to talk together. We don't assume everyone shares all the same information or perspectives. It's an area that can be a cause for division. We can keep lamenting that or talk through it. Talking is not always easy. It's not always a guarantee that we will arrive at agreement. It can be difficult, especially now in the midst of our exhaustion during the pandemic. But if good people come together, I do think good things are possible. This is just one example of how we can make a positive impact in this community together. The season of Epiphany starts with a question. Who is Jesus? What is his mission? Was he a great teacher? Was he a prophet? Was he son of God? In our gospel, John says that a voice came from heaven when Jesus emerged from the waters of his own baptism. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. John the Baptist pointed us toward a person greater than himself. He was willing to to defer to him, willing to be open to what this Son of God had to bring and share. It was a form of humility. And as much as we have to learn from the life and teachings of Jesus, I think we can learn from John's humility and openness as well. As we look back at a shocking week and wonder what the next week will bring, we have an opportunity to build hope and trust one conversation at a time. Amen. Thank you.
Let's pray. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. We pray for our nation, that truth and justice might prevail, that whatever clouded judgment and misinformation has opened the door to extremists would come into the presence of your light and be transformed for the sake of all people. Your son Jesus came to bring light and hope to our world. May the love and wisdom of Christ fill our hearts and minds and guide us in the days ahead to discern what is good and true and just and to continue in the way everlasting. For the sick and those who provide medical care, for the imprisoned and those who show them mercy, for the lonely and those who provide companionship, for all who suffer, especially Tim, Orlin, Marilyn, Joy, Lindsay, Daniel, Claire, Jan, Bev, and Carol. And today we close with an ancient prayer referenced during events this past week, the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And we join in the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.